Hey, Willingdon Church family, I have good news for you. On a recent phone call with faith leaders across the province, our government leaders announced their intention to lift restrictions for worship gatherings as of July 1st. Should COVID-19 cases continue to decline and the percentage of people vaccinated continue to increase, we would then enter phase three of the BC Restart Plan on July 1st. This is really exciting news. As we wait for the announcement, our ministry teams are preparing to reopen church facilities for worship services starting Sunday, July 4th. Over the summer months, we will be open for two services every Sunday at 9 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. You should know we are also working on a safety plan which will allow us to gather together within the guidelines set by the Provincial Health Organization. We are committed to ensuring the safety and health of all those who visit Willingdon Church. Please continue to check our website for more details as provincial government announcements are made. You should also know that we will continue to offer online services and virtual ministry opportunities to connect and care for our church family and the community around the world that tune into our services. We are so grateful for your patience, understanding, and prayers throughout this pandemic season. We praise God for his grace, protection, and provision, and we trust him to lead us forward. We look forward to seeing you in person. That's on July 4th. Please do not hesitate to contact our office if you have any questions. Hey, Willingdon Church family and all of our guests tuning in online, it's great to be with you this weekend. And if you're currently not plugged into our church community, I'd love for you to fill out one of our Connect cards. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can find it just down in the description below. And that way you can hear about what's going on here and ways that you can get involved. Also want to point out our prayer cards to you and anything you're going through right now that you want some prayer support for and, and people to join in with you, uh, please fill that out as well. Let us know what you're going through and even also things you're celebrating that God's doing in your life. Well, got a couple exciting things coming up I want to let you all know about. For starters, we have our ILM weekend coming up and it's going to be next weekend. You're not going to want to miss that. Going to be featuring some of our different international ministries and even have one of our very own leaders uh, Roman preaching a sermon for us. So it's going to be really exciting to just see all of the beautiful diversity at our church celebrated. Also, we have a prayer summit coming up this week on Thursday night at 7 p.m. And you're not going to want to miss that as we pray into the summer season and all the wonderful things that God has going on for our church family and things that we want to be blessing and praying into to see God's kingdom advance. And so come join us. It'll be live streamed. You can find the link on our website. Well, with that being said, I'm going to pass things off now to Pastor Rob. This coming September, we'll be rolling out a new training venture for the Willingdon family. It's called the Ministry Foundations Certificate, a partnership between our church and MB Seminary. This is a fully accredited master's program that would constitute up to one third of a full master's degree. It includes four courses, missional discipleship, interpreting scripture today, Christian leadership practices, and pastoral care. Each course will last for two months, but the on-site lectures for each will consist of only one weekend intensive, Friday evening and all day Saturday. The entire program will run from September through April, and covering foundational aspects of church ministry, the Ministry Foundation Certificate would be suitable for lay workers and for those considering vocational ministry as a step towards more specific training. If you'd like more information, check out the Ministry Foundation's link on the church website, or you can contact me at the email address here. Thanks, Pastor Rob. Let's now move into a time of preparing our hearts and praying for the offering this weekend. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are the giver of all good gifts and you are the one who provides for us as your beloved children. 
And Lord, as you have given so much to us, I pray that you would uh, stir up an excitement and a gratitude in our hearts through which we can give back to you, God, and give back to the amazing work that your church is doing and ways that we can be partnering with you, Lord, in advancing your kingdom. And God, I pray for wisdom for the people who are uh, distributing these funds and uh, deciding which ministries they go to and which new initiatives they support. And Lord Jesus, we just want to see your name glorified and proclaimed through all the world. So God, bless us as we now give and uh, God, just uh, sharing in all the good gifts that you've given to us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to now move into a time of singing praise to God.
the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in with his love for me. With his love for me. In the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I
name is Raphael. Today I will be reading you Romans 4, 1 to 12. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but trusts him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or for the uncircumcised? We see that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Thank you, Raphael, for reading today's passage. Happy Father's Day to all fathers and father figures. We say thank you for your selfless love, protective care, and provision. You have blessed us. And to those who did not receive love, care, and provision from their fathers, we express our sorrow. May we all experience the deep love, tender care, and abundant provision of our Heavenly Father today. Normally, we fathers have an intimate connection with our children. If someone threatens or harms our children, we have an instinctive, visceral reaction. One sunny Sunday afternoon, my father took our family to the zoo. My older brothers and I decided to poke the local lion with a stick, and we were rewarded with a reaction. One bystander, however, was not amused by our antics and threatened to remove us from the zoo. My father had a visceral reaction. Within seconds, he came to our defense and sent the bystander scurrying away. We children have an intimate connection with our fathers. We draw our sense of identity and esteem from our fathers. Who our father is, what he does, and how he's viewed is really important to us. If we see our father being threatened or dishonored, we too have an instinctive, visceral reaction. About 10 years ago, my father and I were at a wedding. Some of the guests had been drinking far too much before and during the wedding reception. At one point, my father was visibly dishonored by one of the inebriated guests who danced inappropriately right in front of him. Immediately, my instincts took over. I was ready to throw hands. All I could think about was protecting my father. In fact, I was so incensed by what had happened, I had to remove myself from the wedding. It took me quite a while to calm down. Today's text has that intimate family connection feel. It's about a father and his children. It's about who is included in the family and why. Paul talks about Abraham, the great forefather of the Jews. And his legacy is really important, not only for Jews, but for all of us who follow Jesus. Let's review a few pieces of his story so that we can better understand Romans chapter 4. Abraham's original name was Abram, meaning exalted father. In Genesis chapter 12, when Abram is 75 years old, God calls him to leave his homeland Ur and take a long journey to the promised land, 
Canaan. God promises to make him a great nation and to bless all the peoples of the earth through him. Time passes. Abram remains childless. In Genesis chapter 15, when Abram is about 85 years old, God confirms his promise to Abram and promises him that he will have a son from his own body to inherit God's promise. Fourteen years later, Genesis chapter 17, when Abram is 99 years old, God again appears to him and renews his promise of innumerable descendants. In fact, to further stamp the promise, God changes his name to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. As a sign of the covenant, God also institutes the circumcision of all his male descendants. God also confirms that the promised son will come through his wife, Sarah, even though she is beyond childbearing age. In Genesis chapter 21, when Abram is 100 years old, Isaac is born. It has been a 25-year walk of trusting God. Romans chapter 4 verse 17 says that Abraham believed in the God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Faith. It's difficult to overestimate the importance of Abraham for the Jews. The Jews trace their spiritual and national identity back to him. In the 2,000 years since his death, he had been elevated to a quasi-divine status. Here are some examples from Jewish writings. Abraham was perfect in all his deeds with the Lord and well-pleasing in righteousness in all the days of his life. Jubilees 23. Abraham did not sin against you. Prayer of Manasseh. Was not Abraham found faithful when tested and it was reckoned to him as righteousness? 1 Maccabees. The Jews claimed that Abraham had not sinned against God. He was counted righteous because of his faithful observance of the law. He was believed to have obeyed perfectly God's commandments before they were given. He had earned his salvation. It's no wonder that Jews were really proud to be known as children of Abraham. They identified with his righteousness and honor and fame. They were flattered to think that the righteousness and renown of Abraham conveyed the same qualities to them and denied those qualities to others. And quite often, this sense of self-esteem as children of Abraham morphed into spiritual and ethnic pride. Any criticism of Abraham would draw a visceral reaction. In light of this, listen to Paul's words in chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? A Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. In chapter 3, Paul has argued that God's righteousness was not revealed due to human obedience through the law, but through the death of Jesus on a Roman cross outside the city gates of Jerusalem. Paul's thesis is that people receive right standing before God only by grace through faith in Jesus, who through his perfect fulfillment of the law and sacrificial death purchased salvation for all who put their trust in him. Paul argues that the only work of righteousness is the sacrificial death of Jesus. So here in chapter 4, Paul invokes the most daring example imaginable to test his thesis, Abraham. In fact, after Jesus, the most prominent figure in Paul's letters is Abraham. He ends verse 3 by quoting Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. It is a key verse in his argument. He quotes it multiple times. Interestingly, 
the Jews used this same verse, Genesis 15, 6, to support their position that Abraham was justified by works. They said that Abraham's faith was itself a work of obedience and thus ground for his justification. They said Abraham's faith had earned him merit before God. In his counter-argument, Paul declares that Abraham was counted righteous when he put his trust in the promise of the previous verse, Genesis 15, 5, when God said that he would have a multitude of descendants. For Paul, Abraham provides conclusive evidence for his thesis. What's that? Our faith in God is not a work that merits us salvation. For certain, Abraham did a lot in his faith journey. He left the civilized world of Ur for a nomadic life in Canaan. He made long, perilous journeys. He accumulated great herds and many servants. He was even willing to sacrifice his own son Isaac, the son of the promise. All of this was truly remarkable, but none of these acts enabled him to fulfill God's promise to him. Abraham had to stand before God and just trust him. And when he stood in God's presence, he had nothing to boast about in relation to his own works. Even though he tried, there was nothing Abraham could do to fulfill the promise given by God. For example, he thought he would adopt Eliezer, his household servant, as heir and thus fulfill the promise through him. Then he considered Ishmael, the son of Hagar, as a possible heir. To both of these human solutions, God said a categorical no. The only road before Abraham was the road of faith. All he could do was believe. Bible commentator James Richards writes this about Abraham's faith. His faith was not a work, not a virtue, not an expression of the heroic will, but a resignation in weakness, a powerlessness in the face of overwhelming opposition to the sovereign word of God. Faith is always a form of poverty. It is born where our personal resources are exhausted, and God's word is vital. It is found where our personal ambitions give way to humble submission. It is found where God alone must act, and all we can do is wait. Abraham, Abraham had to simply surrender himself to God's word and trust him. Faith is complete trust in God, trust in his word and his work. So where do you and I need to exercise this kind of faith in God today? When we consider our walk with God as a whole, we see that it begins with complete trust and it continues with complete trust in spite of setbacks and obstacles. Sometimes we're trusting God for the well-being of a loved one, the salvation of a son or a daughter, trusting him for financial provision, for the restoration of a relationship, or the physical healing uh, of an illness. Faith is complete trust in God, no matter what the circumstance. Paul goes on to support his argument with some logic from the world of work and compensation. Verse 4, now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Counted or credited is the language of accounting. It appears over and over again in our text, about eight times. When used in a financial context, it signifies to put something to someone's account. There are two different ways in which money can be credited to our account as wages, which are earned, or as a gift, which is free and unearned. The work compensation equation of verse 4 reads like this. If we do works, then God owes us. God credits us with righteousness when we work because we've earned it and God is obligated to pay us. This is often referred to as works righteousness. We work to merit our salvation. The grace equation of verse 5 is very different. We trust in God. God owes us nothing. 
yet God credits us with righteousness. This is what happened with Abraham. God, out of his kindness and generosity, gave him a gift. It had nothing to do with Abraham's works. Paul sees a a chasm between works righteousness and grace. We who live the works righteousness equation believe that through our human effort and the strengthening of our moral systems, we have the resources to live up to God's standard and gain his favor. Effectively, we deny we are under the power of sin. How do we know if we're on the path of works righteousness? Quite often by our emotional state. When we're working for our salvation and we're failing, we're anxious, worried, fearful. On the other hand, if we're trusting in God alone and his ability to save us, we're marked by humility and confidence. And our confidence is in Jesus alone. Let's assume for a minute we have died and we're ready to enter heaven. What would be the admission requirements? Often we hear people say things like this. Well, I hope I've done enough. I've tried my best to be a good Christian. That's the way of works. Sometimes we hear, well, I have believed in God and I have tried to do his will. I hope I have pleased God in some way. That is faith plus works. Or sometimes we hear, well, I believe in him with all my heart. That is faith in our faith. Here's the truth. No one is saved based on being good enough, doing enough, or being committed enough, or having enough faith. Only the way of complete trust in Jesus ushers us into the realm of grace. But this kind of grace is offensive to many because grace actually justifies the ungodly. And ungodly was a strong, weighted, offensive word for the Jews. For the Jews, God only justified the morally upright, those living within God's covenant relationship with Israel. The ungodly were the wicked, those living outside of this relationship with no possibility of salvation. Paul applies the ungodly word to Abraham. Yikes! For Paul, all of humanity stands under sin. Romans chapters one through three make it very clear that no one comes anywhere close to God's righteousness in their own character, thoughts, and actions. Not even the most upright of human beings. All of humanity stands justly condemned forever. Even Abraham, ouch, you can can feel the visceral reaction from the Jews. While his hearers are still steaming, Paul adds a bit more fuel to the fire. He has used Israel's greatest forefather as an example to support his thesis. Now he turns to Israel's greatest king, the king under whom the nation of Israel reached its apex. Verse 6. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. If there was any doubt about Abraham's sin, there could be no doubt about David's. He committed the sins of covetousness, adultery, and murder. Verses 7 and 8 are a direct quotation from his psalm, Psalm 32. David could speak from a place of blessing because his sins had been forgiven by a holy God, not because he had been an outstanding law keeper. In fact, God was no longer crediting his sins to him, but had pardoned and covered them. He had not earned this. No, it was credited to him by grace. God justifies people who are still lost in their sin, the wicked. The stunning truth of God's amazing grace should always lead us to worship. We should be filled with an overwhelming sense of wonder at what God has done for us. It is truly astounding that the almighty and all holy God has given us people who lived in sinful rebellion against him, people in whose lives sin was pervasive. He's given them right standing with himself and has clothed us with the righteousness of his son. 
This is grace and grace alone. On hearing this, some Jews would still argue, well, of course, Abraham was counted righteous and David was forgiven because they were Jews. But this blessing is only for the Jews, not for everyone. Is this blessing only for circumcised Jews? Paul returns to his rhetorical style. Verse 9, is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. The sign of circumcision was a constant reminder of God's special covenant relationship with the Jews. It was their distinguishing mark. It authenticated them. The sign became even more important after the exile and dispersion of the Jewish people under the Babylonian, Assyrian, Greek, and Roman empires. Among the, the dispersed Jewish community, tangible symbols of the Jewish faith became ever more important. It was understood that Jews maintained their identity by insisting on circumcision, food laws, and the Sabbath. In some ways, we find a parallel example in the Lower Mainland today in the Sikh community. After traveling to the Punjab a few times, I realized that the Sikh community is much more committed to their tra traditions and culture of origin in Canada than in India. Why? Well, in Canada, the Punjabi community is in the minority. Their religion, Sikhism, is a minority religion. So their identity is at stake. As a result, they hold more tenaciously to their religious traditions and outward symbols, uncut hair, a steel bracelet, a wooden comb, cotton underwear, and a steel sword. In the Punjab, the Church of Jesus is actually growing very rapidly, but not in Canada where Sikhs are doing all they can to hang on to their threatened religious and cultural identity. Perhaps this helps us understand why the Jews held so tenaciously to their traditions. Paul argues that Abraham was declared righteous before he was circumcised. In other words, before receiving the outward sign of the Jewish religion. Even the Jewish rabbis taught that Abraham received the justification of Genesis 15, 6 decades before his actual circumcision. Circumcision, then, could not be the prerequisite for Abraham's righteousness. Instead, it was only the seal of the righteousness he already had by grace through faith. Here's a summary of Paul's logic. If God called and justified Abraham before he had a son, then he was justified before he was the forefather of the Jewish nation. If God justified Abraham before he was circumcised, then he was justified before he was a Jew. Therefore, Abraham was an uncircumcised, unrighteous Gentile when he was counted righteous by God. Boom! You can feel the instinctive, visceral reaction among the Jews. Paul continues in verse 11. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Circumcision had been given by God as a visible seal of righteousness granted. It authenticated and guaranteed the right standing Abraham already had before God. It was a sign of grace. It was not intrinsic or essential to his faith. It was the physical seal of an inner reality. So it follows that Abraham was the father of Gentile believers before he was the father of Jewish believers. Both Gentile and Jewish Christians could appeal to Abraham as father. He is the father of all who believe. He's our father. All people 
all people are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. God's people then are determined not by biological descent from Abraham, but by spiritual descent. Our spiritual identity is determined not by a search on Ancestry.com. No, all, both Jew and Gentile, are adopted into and enter into the blessing of God's family by faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. Perhaps I can use my family as an analogy. My brothers and I are sons of my father by birth. As adults, we have all married. Through the covenant of marriage, our wives have been adopted as daughters-in-law. They are family. They are heirs with us and, re and receive the family blessing with us. So just as they have entered my father's family through marriage, not biological descent, so we enter Abraham's family through faith. This justification by faith was not something added as an emergency measure because a crisis had developed in the implementation of God's original plan. During this pandemic, we've become accustomed to changing government orders with the increase of knowledge in relation to the virus and the increase of case counts. With God, justification by faith was no adjustment based on a new understanding of the human condition or the number of sinners needing salvation. Rather, it was conceived by God before the foundation of the world. It was exemplified by Abraham and consummated in Jesus in the fullness of time. For all, Abraham simply serves as the prototype of saving faith. So a question remains for us. Are we following in the footsteps of Abraham's faith or works righteousness? What does it look like to follow in his footsteps? First, a word for the church family. All who put their trust in Jesus are included in the family of God. The usual barriers to association, race, national background, economic status, political affiliation, etc., have no relevance at all in the kingdom of God. The gospel is for everyone who believes. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verses 28 and 29, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. As a church family, Willingdon, we are not anti-racist because of a political agenda. We live anti-racism because it is actually in our spiritual DNA as children of Abraham. Because we have all been justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we are all equal before God and must be equal before one another. In other words, if we are truly transformed by the gospel, we will reach out to one another in loving acceptance and follow in the footsteps of Abraham together. Second, a word for families. For those of us who have come to Canada from another land, another culture, and now find ourselves transitioning to Canadian culture, it's important to separate faith and culture, especially when multiple generations of the same family are present. Often the older generations hold tenaciously to the cultural ways and language of the land of origin. And the younger generations are eager to transition to the new land. Each one must ask, what is at the heart of the Christian faith? The question is not, what are the beliefs, values, and behaviors of a particular culture? But what are the beliefs, values, and behaviors of the gospel of the kingdom of God? 
Paul speaks to this tension when he writes in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Through Jesus, God's righteousness has been gifted to us. We have been justified before God. We can enter his presence with joy, joy inexpressible. We've been reconciled with God. We have peace with God. His spirit abides in us. These are the inner realities of the gospel that must mark all of us. Third, a word for fathers. The word walk in chapter four, verse 12, is a military term, meaning strictly to march and file. We have a commander in chief who rules over our walk, Jesus. We have a model to follow, Abraham. This walk in the footsteps of Abraham is not about external signs, the uniform we wear, the battalion we belong to, or the medals that adorn us. It is about a genuine relationship of complete trust in Jesus. In Egypt, the Christians are a minority. The overwhelming majority of Egyptians are Muslims. Most Coptic Christians in Egypt have a mark that identifies them, a cross tattooed on their right wrist. This is a powerful symbol. But even in Egypt, being a Christ follower is about the inner life, living a crucified life, dead to sin and alive to God. The cross tattoo only has value if it reflects what is in the heart, the inner reality. Fathers, the outward signs of Christian faith will never draw our children to God. Our children need a real example to follow, the example of a life completely surrendered to God where the inner realities of the gospel are evident. Justification by faith alone, peace with God, life transformation by the power of the Spirit, joy and hope in God. May our children follow us as we follow in the footsteps of Abraham. Fourth, a word for all. As followers of Jesus, we live by faith in him and his work on our behalf. We do not work to earn our salvation. We have been set free from all striving to gain acceptance before God. We are loved and accepted by our heavenly Father. We have received this as a gift through our trust in Jesus. So may we rest in our deep, unshakable, unchanging relationship with God our Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your love for us. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, for our salvation. Jesus, we thank you for going to the cross and taking our sin upon, upon yourself. Thank you, Lord, that you have gifted us with your righteousness. Thank you for justification. Thank you for right standing with you, God. We can sit in your presence. We can know you. We can follow you. Your spirit abides in us. We have been gifted with such an amazing salvation, way beyond anything that we could ever comprehend. And so we thank you and we praise you. Father, I pray for the families of our church. May we walk together. Lord, grandparents, parents, children, may we together understand what it means to follow you, what's at the heart of our faith in you. May we be marked by the inner realities of the gospel. I pray that as a church family, Lord, we would walk together as one, seeing one another the way that you see us. We are all equal before you. Thank you, Father, that you have welcomed all of us into your family. And I pray for the fathers. I pray that we as fathers would follow in the footsteps of Abraham. I pray that our lives would be marked by genuine, true, deep faith in you, God. May we exercise complete trust in you and model that, Lord, for our children, for our grandchildren. God, we live in a time when so much is uncertain, but you are unchanging. Your kingdom is unshakable, 
and you will be with us by your spirit to the end. So we are grateful. We rest in you. We are filled with joy and peace and hope because your kingdom is coming and we are yours now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Don't forget to tell your father that you love him. And now I'm leaving you with some questions for reflection. Thank you all for joining us this weekend. And what a great message that was from Pastor Ray. I don't know about yourselves, but I can always grow in my relationship with God and learning how to trust Him more. And it's such an encouragement to know there's nothing we can do that makes us more or less accepted in God's eyes. He's already given it to us fully. So with that truth in our hearts, let's go forward into this week and see you all at the prayer summit on Thursday.